Tonight, we crown a champion in a city that never sleeps. 32 teams began in the NIT field. Now we're down to two in the mecca of basketball. Georgia Tech and TCU meet. It's the NIT championship game at Madison Square Garden. We've now become a great team. Stevens from the corner. Hammers is able to reject a Kogi. Oh, on the baseline. Georgia Tech will advance to the championship game. Bonsiewski. That's good basketball. Robinson with the lob. And Rich Williams. Washburn with the hook over the top. TCU start to celebrate a trip to the championship game. And we welcome you to Madison Square Garden. Inside the world's most famous arena tonight, two teams that earned their way to the title game with lopsided semifinal wins. Either Georgia Tech or TCU will win the NIT for the first time in school history tonight. Hi again, everyone. Bob Schusen here with Fran Fraschilla. Chris Budden will join us in just a moment. We've got two coaches that talked about the reclamation projects that each of their programs have had this season, and it really is an accomplishment for both to be in this game tonight. Think about it. They've both got four postseason wins, which makes their seasons already a success. One of them will be crowned tonight. And for Georgia Tech, let's take a look at the defense. So fundamentally sound. Think about this. The Bakersfield win was the 20th time this year that they've held somebody under 40% because of Ben Lammers and blocking those shots. The technique perfect watch the close out here forcing the travel now for tcu bob a little bit different in the nit the ball movement has been absolutely exquisite and part of it is because the sophomore alex robinson starting to become a star the eyes have it pay off at the end by kenrich williams and then team ball movement's been outstanding as well side to side play outside in and when you get traffic in there Feed the post, post times two. It's been a winning formula for Jamie Dixon. And Chris Budden, both of these coaches may have come into this season with different expectations, but the achievement obvious tonight. Certainly, but their goals for the postseason were very different. For TCU, they made it very clear their goal was to get to the NCAA tournament. And then when that goal went out the window, Jamie Dixon had to regather his team and come up with a new goal. That was a 24-win season. That would tie for second most wins in a single season in school history. They can get to 24 wins tonight. As for Georgia Tech, Josh Passer makes no secret that this this team has exceeded expectations, and that's because he says there's no entitlement on this team. In fact, he told me today that in the 30-plus team years that he hopes to still coach, he says he doesn't ever think he'll have a team like this. Well, exceeding expectations might be the understatement of the year for Georgia Tech. Halfway through the ACC schedule, Josh Pastner scheduled Tusculum because he was basically told, you're not going to win a game in the ACC. So you're going to need to schedule a scrimmage win, basically, just to make your team feel good about themselves. What did they do? They went out and beat North Carolina to start the year and ended up winning eight ACC games. I just wonder if he can last 30-plus years of coaching. <laughs> the jump hook for Brodzianski misses to start. A couple of tip follows won't go for J.D. Miller. And Josh Akogi able to save it for Georgia Tech. Similarities on offense, Bob. Both teams move the ball well cut well and they have big guys that can really pass it lammers is the point guard for this offense uh, took away the lob good scouting report shot clock to five josh heat penetrates gets caught and stolen by alex robinson rodzianski gets tcu on the board Boy, the guy that's matured all year, but especially in the postseason, Alex Robinson, the sophomore point guard out of Mansfield, Texas. Really good. Lammers right at Brodzianski, gets the block, and it's off Lammers and out of bounds. Let's go back and watch how poised Robinson is. Head always up, surveying the court, under control, finds the open man. Like I said, good formula to start for TCU. Alex Robinson this season has 17 games where he's had at least six assists, including the last four in the NIT. Georgia Tech will play a lot of zone, and they'll mix the zones up. 1-3-1, 1-1-3, 2-3. We'll keep track of them. Desmond Bain sets up Brodzianski. 
And he draws the foul. Lammers picks up his first. So the junior from Slovakia, 28 games this season in double figures, heads to the line. How about the other night, 18 and 9, and doing a lot of work against the 7 foot 6 Taco Fall of UCF. He did a really good job taking it at the big fellow. Only a rebound away from a double double in the semifinal win over UCF. up short Lammers in between two horn frogs gets an offensive rebound and is able to create the Desmond Bain foul and the 2017 NCAA men's final four begins Saturday on CBS at 6 Eastern South Carolina takes on Gonzaga and the opening game of the doubleheader for a spot in the national championship game for more information go to NCAA.com three coaches in the final four making their first appearance including Dana Altman of Oregon, of course, Frank Martin, Mark Few as well. Another offensive rebound for Lammers. Jump hook won't go, and Brodzianski cleans up for TCU. Brodzianski off the window. He's got all six. Well, I guess when you've scored over a seven-foot six player like Taco Fall, Ben Lammers is maybe not going to provide the same challenge. Good move by the junior. Okogi, the talented freshman, still can't get Georgia Tech on the board. Bain, right down the lane. 8-0 start for TCU, and Josh Pastor wants a timeout. The Horn Frogs looking for their first NIT title off to a great start. Georgia Tech has missed their first five from the field. It's an 8-0 start for TCU. Yeah, watch Vlad Brodzianski now. Now, Ben Lammers is an exceptional shot blocker, but he goes right through him and takes away his lane. Oftentimes, a shot blocker wants you to fade away, and he's got the reach to get it. Brodzianski, very clever post player. He's got six points already. Brodzianski averaged just under 10 a game last season as a sophomore, his first year at TCU after transferring. This year was a top 10 scorer in the Big 12 at nearly 14 a game. How much better can he get? Oh, I think he's going to be terrific next year. Remember, early in the year in the Big 12, he had 28 against Kansas. I think everybody in that league knows he's a very good player. Lammers can make this shot at the post. And what I said, Bob, lots of cutting in this offense. Shot clock winding down to Stevens realize it. Hooks a pass to Lammers. He can't handle it. Here comes Robinson. Nice crossover. Back outside for three. Miller. He's got it. It's a double-digit lead for TCU to start. That's actually a long two. Toe on the line for Miller. Kogi blocked, blocked again. Brodzianski called for the foul. And Josh Kogi off to a slow start, but he's fearless. What a season he's had. The freshman out of Snellville, Georgia, all ACC rookie team. Including the ACC tournament for Georgia Tech. They played 21 games against ACC competition. And Josh Akogi scored double figures in 20 of those 21 as Brodzianski sits down, replaced by Kavar Shepard. Rebound for Kenrich Williams off the miss. Georgia Tech at least on the board. From the corner, it's Miller. That's an air ball. 
Off Stevens, out of bounds. Good hands by Shepard. How about this stat, Bob? In eight years as a head coach, Josh Pastner's never lost three games in a row. Shot fakes Ooh. and a dunk by J.D. Miller. And we said it the other night, he's only a sophomore. He's got enormous talent, and it's being harnessed by Jamie Dixon. Robinson rips it away from Todrick Jackson and finishes, plus the foul. TCU blitzing Georgia Tech through the first four plus minutes. Tech still without a field goal. And it's a 13 point lead. TCU, they look like they want it more. Back in the day with Budden when we come back. Welcome back to the NIT. Let's do a little rewind into the history book this tournament. Historians of the NIT believe that in 1948, the field was the strongest of all time. It consisted of five of the nation's top 17. The winner that year was St. Louis, who was led by future Hall of Famer Ed McCauley. Fran, 1948. Oh, yeah. You were old enough to sneak in and see that one, right? I, I was a kid. I was here. Uh -huh. Easy Ed McCauley. He makes my all-time NIT team. And uh, those are some old-timers there, Bob. But Walt Frazier, no old-timer. One him. of those jerseys hanging here in Madison Square Garden. As Walt Frazier's jersey is up in the rafters. Georgia Tech has had ten possessions. They've turned it over three times. And missed all six of their field goal attempts. Backdoor nice. cut. Another turnover. Justin Moore couldn't handle the pass from Jackson. TCU defense exquisite so far. And they've taken away Lammers at the high post. Ooh. Oh, we had a little box and one there for a second, but it's a zone. Through a double team. Another good field goal for J.D. Miller. Good post feed by the senior Kavar Shepard. And the senior class for TCU, a great story. Four of them have accepted a limited role, but they are enjoying the fruits of four years of hard labor on the court. Lammers, finally a field goal for Georgia Tech. Shepard connects. But Chris Budden, you were eavesdropping on the last huddle for Josh Pastner. What was his message to his team? Yeah, obviously not happy. What he told his guys was, one-on-one -on -one basketball is going to get us beat. So I don't know why you're doing this. We have to take advantage of every possession. We're not good enough to take off possession. It's a model they've lived by all season. In fact, inside their locker room, they have a note that says EPIP. -E every possession is precious. And in a game like this, where you're down by 15 quickly, the possessions are even more precious, Chris. If you're TCU, you want to keep your foot on their throat. Robinson called for an offensive foul, using the right arm to hook his way around the defender. And there's only one team that scored fewer points per game in the ACC than Georgia Tech. They only average a shade under 68 per game, 14th in their league. So they're not really built to blitz you with a lot of points. They have to win at the defensive end. Oh, exactly. And in this tournament, that's been their calling card. Four opponents are averaging about 60, low 60s. Todd McJackson, short.
Can't think of a poor shot yet by TCU in this game. That'll get it done again. Nice look from Michael Williams as he found Shepard. Uh, four of those seniors we talked about on the floor right now, they went 0-18 as freshmen, Bob. So they're enjoying this NIT run. Todd Jackson. Yes, sweet move of the post. Shepard a little too strong. Kenrich Williams, though, taps it to himself, rips away the offensive rebound. Michael Williams steps into a three, and that's on clear by Quentin Stevens. Stevens for three. Way short from way outside. Uh, we talked about TCU's ball movement. Watch it right here. Go side to side against that zone. Watch the swing of the ball and right inside. And Brandon Parrish gets it done. TCU has seven assists on their nine made field goals. And Rich Williams sets up Chris Washburn, and that shot fake creates the foul. So seven assists on nine field goals. That's 77% uh, of their baskets. Wow. Right? Wow. No, I, there's a reason for, for that uh, remedial math. Okay. The average in college basketball this year, 52% of teams' field goals assisted. So that's pretty high. And another important number, Ben Lammers just picked up his second foul. You mean one plus one is two. You can put the abacus away now. Okay. The women's final four is set. South Carolina will take on Stanford. And UConn faces Mississippi State. Spots in the national championship game. Up for grabs when the women's final four begins Sunday at 6.30 Eastern on ESPN. You can go to NCAA.com for more at the home for all 90 NCAA championships. Jackson drives, and that's a foul on Chris Washburn. Two free throws for Todrick Jackson when we come back, but Georgia Tech shooting 18% from the field right now, held to a 2-for-11 start in the Big Apple. ESPN's exclusive presentation of the NIT is brought to you by Lowe's. 16-point lead for TCU over Georgia Tech in the NIT championship game here at Madison Square Garden. Bob Wachusen, Fran Priscilla, Chris Budden, and Fran, we were back in Kansas City about two and a half weeks ago, and we saw one of the biggest upsets this year in college basketball with TCU beat Kansas, who was number one at the time. Yes, that was the day that Josh Jackson did not play for Kansas, suspended for the opening round, but... Give TCU credit. Won a tough, hard-fought game, and it's propelled them into the NIT. And, Bob, you pointed out a number of times in this tournament, they lost their last seven regular season games. Well, you talk about a season of firsts for Jamie Dixon's team. That was the first time that TCU had ever beaten a number one ranked team. It gave them their first ever trip to the Big 12 tournament semifinals with that win. Now they're in their first ever NIT championship game. He wanted to go to his alma mater and take what he thought was a sleeping giant and turn it into a factor in one of the most, if not maybe the most competitive overall conference of college basketball. He did that in his first year. Yeah, and keep in mind that this team was in the uh, Conference USA, it was in the Mountain West, and, and once they found a home in the Big 12, and they fixed the facility, which is now a beautiful arena. It's become a very attractive job, and he's making it even better. Here comes Akogi. Akogi pulls up, uses the glass, and that's another rebound for Cambridge Williams. 
Remember, this is only the fifth year TCU has been in the Big 12. In fact, the sixth conference wins this year, the most of their history in the league. Brodzianski with the left hand short. Looking for his own miss, and it's out off Brodzianski. Let's check in with Chris. Well, Bob, I talked to Jamie Dixon today about the idea of success at his alma mater, and if it felt different than having success at other places. And he said, to be quite honest with you, I don't even have time to be sentimental. You're just constantly thinking about the next game. He goes, honestly, right now, this just feels like a regular Big East game. He said, but maybe after tonight, depending on how it goes, I'll sit back and maybe have a chance to be sentimental. Hey, she, she makes a great point, Chris does, because Jamie Dixon has 27 wins in the garden. That's, that's two seasons worth of Nick's home wins. Think about how successful he's been here. You really have become a Dallas native, haven't you? You're not afraid to come back to New oh, York and anger a, every Big Apple native. I'm a bitter Knicks fan. Yes, you are. Sylvester Obanda was able to score inside. TCU's missed five of their last six from the field, so Jamie Dixon wants a timeout as Georgia Tech is trying to crawl their way back into the game here in the first half. You know, when I was a kid, I used to be up in here in the blue seats four dollars and fifty cents for a Knicks ticket got to see Walt Frazier and Earl Monroe Willis Reed snuck in on a few occasions and I snuck down on a few occasions there were seats available back in some of those seats. amazing what a couple bucks to the ushers could do back then well those blue seats that you see up there and the rafters here at the garden that really is the last remaining fossil of what is a completely new building over the last decade or so it's a total remake but when we were growing up you had that ring of blue seats around the top and then the rainbow of seats down to the red seats right by the court and the one thing that's never changed of course is the iconic ceiling when you look up here at the guard you know yep. just where you are absolutely want to hear a great story about the blue seats i'm a freshman at nazareth high school in 1972-73 my varsity coach is sitting right in front of me in the blue seats, way up at the top, Pete Gillen. Yep, now he later went to college the next year, and the rest is history. Terrific coach in Virginia and Providence for a savior. And now a broadcaster. And now an outstanding broadcaster. Not just another Joe Bag of Donuts, by the way. Yeah. He's my second favorite broadcaster, by the way. <laughs> I really enjoyed Dan Dockage. <laughs> oh, man. You just, I just <laughs> comes up short. Here's nice. a run out for Jackson. Todrick Jackson gets the hang from the rim. Instant offense. We talked about how hard it is for Georgia Tech to score, but he's been in double figures off the bench in 12 of his last 15. Deflected pass. A Kogi creates the steal, gets the hit ahead. That's another Georgia Tech dunk. Jamie Dixon wanted a foul, but it was aggressive, tough, hard-nosed D by the Yellow Jackets. I think Georgia Tech lulled him to sleep. Robinson got stuffed inside and has to reset. Five to shoot. Henrich Williams stripped away. One to shoot. It will stay with TCU, but it's a catch and shoot situation with one tick on the shot clock. See if they have something here. Special situation. Little screening action. Maybe screen the screener. Cause a little confusion. There it is. Quick catch. Did he beat the timer? It is a shot clock violation. As John Gaffney said, Desmond Bain didn't get it off in time. Couple of Irishmen right there, hashing it out. Of course, Jamie's family from the Bronx. He grew up in California, but his dad and mom Moved out to the Sunshine State. Eight century pass. 
He is stolen, and it looks like a foul may have been called. And that is a foul on Sylvester Obonda of Georgia Tech. First on Abonda. And you can see, by the way, again, if you're not familiar with the experimental rules we've had so far this year in the NIT, and something we expect will probably be in major college basketball going forward, when we hit the 9.59 mark in the first half, the team fouls reset. So now it is five fouls for the bonus in the second half of the first half. We play 10-minute segments. Yeah, the next five fouls gets you to the penalty. And that's to simulate four quarters. And as I've said time and time again, it's a, it's a FIBA rule. I love it because the flow of the game is better. There's less free throw shooting. We've done so many games. We're at the 10 minute mark of the first half. Both teams are in the bonus, sometimes a double bonus. So this resets it and allows you to play on. Hayward can't hit the three. And a push is called underneath, I believe, on a Bonda again. That's his second. You know, you know, here's a couple of FIBA rules I love. You ready? On an offensive rebound, because it's a 24-second shot clock, if you get an offensive rebound, the clock is only reset to 14, which is great because it speeds up the game. I would love to see that in college basketball. You know, 30-second clock, maybe it resets to 20 or 15. Georgia Tech has gone man, and it's really bothered TCU. Robinson again with the shot clock down to five. One on one to the corner. Deflected, and that hit the official and stays in bounds, which allows Stevens a run out and a foul called on Desmond Bain, who thought he had a block. So Quentin Stevens will go to the line. Georgia Tech has dialed up the defensive intensity, and Fran, it's made a big difference in this last stretch. Absolutely, they're getting out and running, and you want to score easy when you're in the postseason. Kim. Bob Oshusen, Fran Fraschilla, Chris Budden back at the NIT championship game. Georgia Tech might be behind on the scoreboard, but Fran, you notice things about the culture that Josh Pastner is building at Georgia Tech. Absolutely. Watch this steal by Stevens. And he's going to get fouled hard by Desmond Bain, who's just trying to hustle back into the play. But keep your eye on Stevens when he goes down. You'll see all four teammates. One, here comes two, three, and four into the picture, making sure their teammates all right. That's practiced. Okay, that's a winning culture. Anytime a guy goes to the floor, hustle play, gets fouled, your teammates run over, grab them, make sure you're okay. And I'm just telling you, that did not happen by accident. Now, we were listening in to Josh Pastner's pregame speech to his team, and he talked about from the time I had you guys back in April, when we first met all the way through the summer, all the way through the season until now, it's always been about team, team, team. That is our DNA. That is our culture. And I don't know, it sounds like coach speak to me, but it seems to be a message that resonates with these players. Well, it's mandatory because if you're in the ACC trying to beat teams like Duke, Carolina, and Virginia, and by the way, this team upset three top 25 teams this year, you're not going to, you're usually not going to win on your town. It's got to be about culture. Good help by Heath. Henrich Williams trying to go around Stevens from the corner. J.D. Miller. Heath's got the rebound. Todrick Jackson pulls up. Hits a three. Oh, yeah. Microwave. Todrick Jackson off the bench. And he comes off the bench for a reason. Because he's comfortable putting points up off the bench. Henrich Williams from NBA range. Offensive rebound and a shot fake by Miller. J.D. Miller with a chance for a three-point play. I like the threes occasionally, but this kid could dominate in the paint. We're talking about a guy 6'8", 6'9", only a sophomore. There was some question whether Jamie Dixon was going to bring him back for his sophomore year. And here's a guy that's accepting the winning culture. 
that Jamie Dixon is bringing. That ended a 10-0 run for Georgia Tech. Let's check in with Chris. Well, I talked with Quentin Stevens today about the culture of this team, and he says, I don't think it's accident. I think it's just the personnel that we have. So many seniors, when they came back, talked to the freshmen and said, this is the way that we want to do it. And when you watch what Josh Pastor does with this team during shoot-around today, there were some tournament officials here. He goes, I want you to go up to them, shake all their hands, and say thank you. Just a little bit of what he preaches to his team. That is a great message that Josh Pastner delivered to his team, and that's the third foul on Sylvester Obanda. You know, I said this midway through the ACC. When he got four wins, he was the ACC coach of the year. He ended up getting eight. And as I mentioned, knocking off North Carolina on New Year's Eve, drilling Florida State at home, and beating Notre Dame at the buzzer. Had some quality wins this year. A lot of excitement in Atlanta. Robinson, tough shot. Gets it to go. Good response by TCU. Lammers back in the game with two fouls. Sends one to Okoge. You know, we talked about ball movement, TCU's ball movement. In the postseason, 73% of... Georgia Tech's baskets coming off the assist. Backdoor cut, and Rich Williams lost it. And it looks like a foul was called. So Quentin Stevens called for the foul. That'll put Kenrich Williams at the line. 18 double doubles this season for the junior from Waco. Tremendous. Missed all last year with a knee injury. And by the way, did not have a Division I scholarship. When he came out of Waco University High School, think about it. Scott Drew passed up on this guy right in his backyard. Went to junior college for one year and ended up in Fort Worth. Coming up next, you don't want to miss the high-flying action of the State Farm Slam Dunk and three-point championship from Phoenix, Arizona. That'll also be streaming live on the ESPN app and watch ESPN. That's right after we're done with the NIT title game here at the Garden. Watch the cutting and then watch Lammers. Reach in foul. The bar Shepard. Only team foul number two for TCU and in that, the last 10 minutes. Exactly, and that's my point. If we were under normal rules, we might be at the seventh or eighth foul by now. We'd be going to the foul line instead. Ball out, keep playing, flow the game better. Out of bounds off Shepard. Five to shoot for Georgia Tech. What a jump start for next season for both teams, but for TCU, top six scorers are back. Lammers, tough fadeaway. Williams for three. The coach's son, Josh Heath, struggled with the dribble there for a moment. That's right. He started at South Florida for his dad, Stan Heath, now an assistant coach at Boston College. He's in the building tonight. A Kogi muscles one up. The tip follow won't go. There's a Kogi getting his own miss. Draws the foul on Kavar Shepard. How many white jerseys were around there, right? And Akogi just stayed with it. It's only six foot four, a freshman. Still yep. averages five and a half rebounds a game. Exactly. And his AAU coach, when he was a ninth grader, gave him the nickname nonstop. And there's a perfect illustration of how he earned that nickname. Kenny Anderson and Stephon Marbury are the only two freshmen in Georgia Tech history to score more points in a single season their freshman year than Josh Okogie. Watch how focused he is on the video. He's locked in, sitting up front, trying to absorb the scouting report that Eric Reveno, the assistant coach, was providing nonstop. 
Concentration, non-stop effort. Little 1-3-1, look at Stevens out there now at 6-9. Just trying to get in a passing lane. Brodzianski, a flop not call. His jump hook won't go, taken off the rim by Stevens. Lammers slips. He'll try a jumper. Kenrich Wilkins falling out of bounds. Outlets to Robinson. Oh, nice. Brodzianski nice. finishes yep. off the roll yep. from Alex Robinson. Because he hesitated at the point of the screen, he created indecision, and that's what we call a pocket pass. You come off that ball screen, you put the big guy in a situation where he's not sure whether to stay or get back. Lammers finds Stevens wildly out of control, and here comes Kenrich Williams trying to go coast to coast. He's tripped up. That'll be a Georgia Tech foul. Let's watch, Bob. Watch A-Rob. Comes off the screen. Little hesitation. Does Lammer stay? No. He gets caught. Excellent done. Pocket pass. Right in the pocket of his teammate. And, and Bob, guys. All right, Chris, thanks very much. Back at the Garden. Just another week for the folks here at Madison Square Garden. This past weekend, South Carolina in the East Regional end up going to the Final Four. Then Monday night, the Knicks and Pistons played. Tuesday night, we were here for the NIT semifinals. Then on Wednesday night, the Knicks back in action, taking on the Heat. We're back here for the NIT championship game tonight. And tomorrow night, let's go Rangers, as they'll take on the Pittsburgh Penguins. It is never quiet in the world's most famous arena. I love what the Knicks are doing. Everything they possibly can to get that lottery pick. I love it, man. Markel Fultz to the Knicks, okay? <laughs> Markel and the Zinger, I can't wait. Then I'll start cheering for the Knicks again. Remember that night the Knicks were booing when Zinger was taken? And I had to calm everybody down? Come on. Good times again. You are looking for maximum ping pong balls. Junk the triangle, will you? Come on, hold <laughs> a sec. One of two at the line for Williams. Hey, by the way, who's the all-time leading scorer in the NIT? To Ramis Bennerman of Siena. Wow. 174 points. And Siena won it one year. How about that? Lammers in the post. Fades away. He has not gotten on track since picking up two early fouls. Backdoor cut. Handled by Miller. A little too strong. Lammers is able to grab the rebound. Okogi off to Jackson. Well, what a year he's had. Average about 12 a game, but dynamite off the bench. And tonight they need those points. Robinson double team. Wraps a pass that fortunately ends up with Williams, who comes up short for three. And Brodzianski, an easy offensive rebound and a reset for TCU. Fortunate, too. And a good job by uh, Robinson to slow things down. If you're TCU, you're off to such a great start. You want to have a double-digit lead going into the half. And for Georgia Tech, just carve into it slowly but surely. Brodzianski with the left hand, smoothly done over Lammers. You know, last year as a sophomore, Bob, he played with no physicality at all. And he's never going to be a, a, a bruise brother. But boy, has he become a good player. Jackson, a long two. Man, he had a high of 29 this year against Boston College off the bench. What a weapon. J.D. Miller. Way up 
up in the air for the rebound goes to Kogi. That's six rebounds for Josh Kogi here in the first half. Tell you what, J.D. Miller's guarding Kogi. I try to get some sort of ISO play for him. Big guy on Kogi. He sets up Lammers. That close to a three-point play. Well, let's watch some of the little things TCU's done tonight, Bob. I want you to watch Kenrich Williams on this rebound. Watch him look down at his feet to make sure he's in bounds. And he knows he's going out of bounds. Holds on to it to the last minute. Just a good, smart, cerebral play. Back to single digits. Georgia Tech behind. 112 to go. Of course, Kenrich Williams. A double-double machine, honorable mention all Big 12 this year with 18 double-doubles. Led the Big 12 in that category. But you're Josh Pastner. You were down by 17. What's a win? Single digits at halftime, that's a win? It's, it's a psychological win, and for TCU, really, a psychological loss because they've squandered, you know, half of that lead. Williams on the baseline, score the bucket, plus the foul, as Josh Heath fouled him on the way up. Well, he saw that graphic where he was 0 for 2 from the field, and he said, I got to get going a little bit. What a junior year this guy had in the Big 12. Watch the drive. He's kind of a tweener size guy, can play three or four, but a relentless motor, as evidenced by all those double-doubles. I think TCU will be in the top half of the Big 12 next year. Everybody back with recruiting class. Top half of the Big 12 puts you in the NCAA tournament. Exactly. Robert Jackson had his pocket picked by Kenrich Williams. Williams fouled hard. Scary when you see players full speed heading towards that stanchion. And it's good to see them all get back up. Yeah, but you can see at the very end, Jackson tried to hold... Hold up, Kenrich Williams. Yep, take a look right here. Now watch the poke away, and then you see the athleticism. Jackson's going to hustle. He's going to make a play on the ball, and then he's going to try to hold Williams up, and he did a pretty good job of that. This veteran crew didn't have to go to the monitor. Well, you mentioned the knee injury for Kenrich Williams. He went 618 days between games before playing in the second game last year. And now this year has taken his game to a whole different level. Yeah, he really has. And uh, again, you love it when guys come out of oblivion, you know, not recruited, not on anybody's top 100. Might have been in the top 50 in McLennan County down there in Central Texas, but... A lot of kids in college basketball like that this year. Rankings don't mean much. Akogi gives it up to Lammers. He's fouled. And again, close to an old-fashioned three-point play. And speaking of guys, of guys that came out of nowhere, how about Josh Akogi? Some people didn't even have him in their top 50 in the state of Georgia. That foul on Kenrich Williams was his first. I think you mentioned the other night, Bob, right? Same high school as Robert Carter, who uh, played at Georgia Tech before transferring to Maryland. And his high school coach told uh, Brian Gregory and that previous staff, I've got a good one. And he was right. And the fact that Robert Carter went to Tech was, according to Josh Okogie, when he talked to us at practice the other day, what put Tech on his radar a bit. But under-recruited to the point that it wasn't so much that Georgia Tech was on his radar. He was lucky that he was on theirs. <laughs> yeah, anybody's radar. I would say it turned out to be a pretty good gamble. And what a great kid to talk to yesterday. TCU can hold for one up 11. They led by as many as 17 here in the first half.
Robinson got caught in midair, threw it to nowhere. Three seconds to go in the half. Quentin Stevens beats the buzzer, comes up short. It's an 11 point lead for TCU. And Fran balance for the Frogs as they have a lot of guys that have shown up so far in the box. Yeah, court. exactly. Nobody really getting it done individually, but you see the assists, and that's been a key part of their ball movement and success. Let's go over to Chris. Well, Coach Dixon, you guys were able to get to such a fast start. You're up by double digits before the first media timeout. How did you guys get out so fast? Well, our defense was good. We came up with loose balls, got some transition buckets. Uh, I thought we really defended well. They got to the line a little bit as the game went on, so we got to keep them off the free throw line. Really, I just think they're having trouble with us and just putting their head down and driving and, and, and looking for some calls, so we got to be prepared for that. What do you tell your guys during halftime to inspire the same kind of start in the second half? Well, we're playing hard. There's no question about it. we got to be a little bit better offensively. I think they're doing a pretty good job on the ball screen, so we've got to adjust a little bit to that. Thanks, Coach. Thank TCU shoots 45% to be 32% for Georgia Tech. Two teams both looking for their first NIT titles. Time for Chris Cotter and Dallin Cuff in the studio with the Halftime Report. Chris? Thank you, Bob. Dallin Cuff is here in studio with me. Welcome back to the National Invitation Tournament. The scene outside on 7th Avenue here in New York City, inside the Garden. TCU at one point led by 17, and they lead Georgia Tech by 11 as we're set for the start of the second half. Bob Schusen, Fran Fraschilla, Chris Budden is with us here as well. Not sure if Georgia Tech has an offensive push in them in the second half, we'll find out. But if they are to make a push, they have to be better at the defensive end because disrupting TCU's offensive execution, that was a challenge for the Ramblin' Wreck in the first half. It really was, and think about it. TCU did not make a three, but they did damage in the painted area. Nine assists, 14 made field goals. The ball movement, outstanding. And as you uh, alluded to in the first half, Bob, lots of points in the paint for the Horn Frogs. Good execution. Watch the hands by Robinson. Watch him survey the court. Trying to figure out what he's got. He sees the numbers, finds his trailer, and he pays it off. Really well done by the Horn Frogs in that first half. And across the board, a statistical advantage for TCU. In the paint, off of turnovers, and as you see, 12 of their 14 made field goals in the painted area. But that's a good start to the second half on the drive by Josh Akogi. Paint points for Georgia Tech, and just like that, the lead back to single digits. Yeah, that time J.D. Miller got caught watching the paint dry because Okogie just sliced and diced him on that cut. Robinson is fouled. Chris? Well, drawing it up, just like Josh Pastor had told me coming out of halftime, he said, we'll learn a lot by these first few minutes. We need a score, a stop, and then a score. Some other things that he was upset with, he says, easy layups, we're not good enough to miss those, and we have to be quicker on our cuts. He also then compared it to a boxing match. And why not if you're at Madison Square Garden? He said, we got to go five rounds. There's not a shot that's going to give you 11 points, so we got to go five. We're against the ropes. We just got to survive at this point. Chris is right. There's been some great battles, boxing matches in this arena. Frazier Ali in 71. That was uh, one of the great fights in the history of boxing. But, you know, I always felt, Bob, and you've heard me say this during the year, if you're TCU and you're up 11, the worst thing that can happen after four minutes is that you've given away a big part of that lead. You've got to come out with the same fire you did to start the first half and try to make 11, 16, or 17 at the first uh, media timeout. We used to practice the first four minutes of the second half when I was coaching. Too strong for heat. How do you practice the first four minutes? Very simple. You screen hard, you cut hard, you get loose balls, you take the ball to the basket. Robinson does just that. Just like that. You don't want to settle for contested jump shots like that. Miller muscles one up. That won't go. Quentin Stevens. Yes. Well, that's important because Quentin Stevens is finishing his Georgia Tech career on a roll. And you see the slow start tonight. Bain, 
short. And a nice wall up by Lammers. And he's fouled. It looks like Brodzianski pushed Ben Lammers and got hit with the personal. Let's go back and watch this shot now. Quinn Stevens, my only problem with this shot, is going to pull up, doesn't really know where his feet are, and he ends up making a very long two. And it's just a little bit more quarter wear right there. He would have got the extra point. But excellent student, Mr. Georgia Tech. And there he is again. Three. That's educating your feet right there from the senior. Rodzianski with the left hand. Lammers had to be careful, Bob. You see him shy away. Didn't want to pick up the third. Tie up. Held ball. Good hands from J.D. Miller on the Akogi drive. Let's go back now. This time, look where his feet are. Nicely behind the line and... He's going to lament if they lose this game by one. Like he could have had six instead of five, but hey, needless to say, what a great finish to his career this young man has had. His game has been so well-rounded this season. The top returning scorer from last year's Georgia Tech team and only averaged five points. Wow. But in his first three years, how about this? He had 77 total assists in three years. He's got 80 assists this year. Brodzianski. Oh, by Ken Rich Williams, plus the foul. This is how you average the amount of rebounds he does and get all those double-doubles. Take a look. That ball came off really soft from Brodzianski. Watch how it just sits on the rim, tees it up, and a good finish by the junior from Waco. And the third foul on Lammers. A bonus or insult to injury for Georgia Tech. So Lammer stays in the game with three with his team down 13. And watch Josh Kogi right here and tie up and watch that knee bend back a little bit. He's shaking up and yeah. over on the bench. Heath to the corner to Hayward. Yes. Well, we haven't mentioned Corey Hayward's name a lot, but he is solid. No mistake guy, outstanding defender. Hasn't had a turnover in like a year. Robinson tries a triple. There's a run out for Heath. Gets it to Todrick Jackson. He can't finish it, but tip follow won't go. For Stevens. Bain floats one to Williams. He'll drive it. And throws it down again. And then gets a steal. Blocked. What an answer by wow. Quentin Stevens on Williams. The lob. Lammers can't finish. But a foul is called. What did I say, Bob, about starting the second half? TCU has come out hard. But so has Georgia Tech. Watch the finish by Kenrich Williams. Watch the steal. And then, you know what? No, get that out of here. Come on. Big plays made at the rim at both ends. And Desmond Bain just picked up his third foul. Michael Williams coming back in for TCU, and he will replace Desmond Bain. So Bain to the bench with three, while Lammers stays on the floor for Georgia Tech with three. But obviously the scoreboard probably dictates those two respective coaching decisions. That's right. Because Josh Pastner can't take Lammers off the floor. There's that scrappiness of Hayward again. He's got four turnovers in the last about a 290 minutes. Williams hits a three. Doing it inside and outside. Remember that slow start we talked about? Picking it up. TCU's done a really good job of handling all those cuts. 
Lammers around Brodzianski. Couldn't get it to go. Michael Williams on the floor. Saves it for TCU. Looks like two teams playing for a championship. Robinson loves it. And there's a follow by Brodzianski. Off the miss by Williams. How about that TCU bench? Oh, Karch Karai would have loved this. The spike. Horn Frogs in the building. Take a look. Here we go. We said they had to come out with energy, and they have. In the garden. No place better. A lot of energy here at the Garden. Let's bring it back to the guy who also brought some excitement here. In 1967, saw the NIT final at the Old Garden. The winner of that final was Southern Illinois, and a man still trying to hone his style at that time, Walter Clyde Frazier. Back in the good old days of the Knicks, guys. Exactly. He was the MVP of the 1967 NIT, Bob. Last game ever played in the Old Garden. They knocked off Marquette. He was subsequently drafted by the New York Knicks, number one, and uh, what a career. And is still a legend here in New York as he works Knicks games on television all the time. Absolutely. So celebrated you, a birthday yesterday. You got generations of Knicks fans that have grown up listening to Clyde, past the generations that grew up watching Clyde. Triple doubles, they don't happen too often in college basketball. As Kenrich Williams had a triple double, the second in TCU history when they beat Richmond in the quarters he had 11 points 14 rebounds and 10 assists the only other player to ever have a triple double for TCU is in the building tonight we'll get a look at him a little bit later on Kurt Thomas who played for the Knicks former New York well. Knicks absolutely and the Heat among other franchises in the NBA AD Miller with the rebound remember Walt Frazier's greatest double double ever 1970s game seven Knicks Lakers championship 36 points 19 rebounds and Willis comes out of the tunnel and then Clyde turns into the hero actually it might have been 19 assists <laughs> my man John our stack guy he's not helping me at all <laughs> that jumper goes down for Alex Robinson where are the answers now for Georgia Tech ball movement you know they don't play one-on-one -on -one basketball other than Jackson and they've got to get better ball movement better cutting and they got to be timely and I think you got to attack the basket Jackson tried to do just that yeah you can't settle for jump shots at this point and in fact getting to the basket means you might get to the line a little more as well Robinson puts up an air ball, but Johnny on the spot again is Kenrich Williams. And a quick timeout called by Jamie Dixon. So TCU led by as many as 17 in the first half. And they have opened up a 17-point lead here in the second half with Kenrich Williams leading the way. There is a look at the owner of the only other triple-double in TCU history. He had a pretty good year back in 95. Chris Cotter in studio, just a reminder, we're just over a half hour away from the three-point shooting and slam dunk competition out in Phoenix. Matt Jones from Duke Rice Alford representing UCLA. Just a couple of those that will compete 33 minutes from now. Bob, Fran, we'll see you then. All right, Chris, thanks very much. Well, obviously those players that will appear in the three-point shooting contest, the slam dunk championship, have put up some impressive numbers this season. But I don't know individually if there were more impressive numbers put up by any player in the Big 12 than Kenrich Williams. He's right now a rebound away from what would be his 19th double-double this season. Yep, and uh, emblematic of the great rise this year of TCU. Jamie Dixon comes in. Now Trent Johnson left these guys behind. Did a solid job. He did not play last year. And don't forget, Jalen Fisher, the highest-ranked recruit in TCU history, who started the entire season, has missed the NIT with the broken wrist. And, and they're doing it without him. He's going to be an outstanding player next year. 
Akogi maneuvers inside, and a chance for a three-point play. Well, he will probably have to be the catalyst if Georgia Tech is going to put together a run to get back in the game. Yes, nicely done. Again, we talked about it. Attack the paint. And get yourself to the line like he's about to do. And right now, if you're Georgia Tech, you're down 15. You want to be at down 10 with 10 to go. You just carve a little bit of the time off. 16 straight games and double figures for Josh Akogi. Only a freshman. Came out of nowhere when he dropped 38 on Tulane in the non-conference early in the year, and he took off from there. Little 1-3-1 now, trying to get a, a deflection, get a piece of the ball, maybe create a turnover. There you go. Brodzianski, the jump hook is pure again. Remember, he took it right to Taco Fall the other night. And Ben Lammers, we know it, Bob. He's hard to score over. ACC Defensive Player of the Year. Good help. Jackson. It's a three. The lead down to 13. And Georgia Tech not done yet. Under 13 minutes to go. Robinson gets his own miss and then is fouled on a reach in by Quentin Stevens. That's the second on Stevens. What you like about TCU tonight is Georgia Tech changes up their defenses and they pretty much have been locked in with an answer for everything they've seen. No confusion. Now the foul, is this an experimental rule? Or does it go to 20 seconds? That's exactly what the officials are going over and adjusting the clock by. That's the experimental rule. That if the foul takes place under 12, and you see, the reason it's staying at 30 is because when he grabbed the rebound, it's a new clock and then the foul. Had there been the foul under 20 seconds, it would have been rebooted to 20. And the officials are still having a conversation. Well, it's this is new to them too. That's why you. That's why it's called an. Bob, it's an experimental rule. Okay, they're they're experimenting right now with the right answer. And now Boborowski is going to come back over and make sure that we know exactly what their thinking is. And now they take two seconds off the shot clock because the foul occurred after the rebound. That's right. And that's why you call it an experiment. <laughs> <laughs> Rodzianski, tough catch in the corner. Couldn't handle it. And it looks like it's going to go to Georgia Tech. Jamie Dixon can't believe it. Jamie Dixon is like, I'm standing two feet away. It's okay. He's so happy to be coaching on March 30th. You know, TC, would you have taken a bet that TCU would be the last Big 12 team playing at the end of the year on January 1? Godric Jackson comes up short, and Brodzianski's got the rebound. A turnover. Jackson the other way. Muscles it in. The lead down to 11. Sloppy play and Todrick Jackson. He knows what to do with it. 13th time that he's been in double figures in the last 17. Short on the jump hook, Vlad Brodzianski, but an offensive rebound for Kenrich Williams. He's got his double-double, number 19 this season. See how they got Robinson, the point guard, in the middle of the zone. Michael Williams hits a three. How big was that offensive rebound now for Kenrich Williams? And how about Michael Williams? Part-time starter for three years, not used as much this year. But without Fisher out there, 
What a great way to end your senior year. Todrick Jackson has it poked away. Brodzianski was able to get it to Michael Williams. And again, the experimental rules, when the clock goes under 10 minutes, you will see the team fouls reset. Each team with one more foul to give in the first 10 minutes. But the fouls will zero out at 9.59 on the clock. There's a block by Lammers, but he's not there to protect the rim on the follow by Brodzianski. Robinson drives it so hard, Lammers becomes a magnet. Great hands by Michael Williams. It's another Tech turnover. Robinson for three. Todrick Jackson. A lot of contact and an offensive foul called on Jackson. That's his third. TCU and Georgia Tech both playing for their first ever NIT title here at the Garden. Welcome back to New York. Let's do some more trivia for you, sports history buffs. The last top 10 team to compete in the NIT was University of North Carolina, who lost in the first round to Purdue back in 1974. That's right, Chris. Mr. They, Encyclopedia, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. Fran, what, what you got to add on that? Well, you know what? The, Purdue actually beat Utah in the final, but Mike Sojourner of Utah was the MVP. That team was coached by Bill Foster, who later went to Duke, and then Knicks wound up drafting a guy on that Utah team, Tiki Burden, uh, the late Tiki Burden, but... Uh, that was an amazing year, 1974, Bob, because it was the last year that major conferences only sent one team to the NCAA tournament. It's also the year that UCLA lost to NC State. And then also the year the 88-game streak ended by Notre Dame of, of UCLA fans. And a special thanks to Chris Greer, who's been providing us with all these still photographs from around the garden and action shots during our semifinal games on Tuesday night. Kenrich Williams fades away. We really enjoyed so many of the looks at NIT's past and just famous moments past here at the Garden. Absolutely. For guys like us who grew up around here, it's, it's fun to reminisce. Although I did not see Easy Ed McCollum play. Stevens for three. Out of bounds off Bain. And we'll have the NCAA Women's Final Four Friday on ESPN2 from Dallas at 7.30 Eastern. Stanford takes on South Carolina in game number one. And then UConn riding a 111-game win streak in their 10th straight Final Four against Mississippi State in game two. Both games presented by Capital One and streaming live on the ESPN app and watch ESPN. You think you have excellence in women's basketball, you obviously think of UConn and Gino Ariema for Tara Vanderveer taking Stanford back to the Final Four again. What an incredible program she's built on the farm. Been a tough night for Ben Lammers. He is now one for nine from the field. Has eight points, but most of his damage done at the line. never played in a postseason championship game in basketball until tonight and right now they're eight and a half minutes away from an NIT title here at the Garden if they can hold on shot clock violation well defended in the corner by a Kogi as he hampered Brandon Parrish well we said this the other night Bob for TCU a traditional football type school this would be like a good bowl game in fact a very good bowl game maybe not a BCS playoff game, but maybe a, a championship in the NIT is like a New, Year, New Year's Day bowl game. A cotton ball, if you will. A Kogi. That won't go. Another rebound for Kenrich Williams. Gary He's got 12. Pat yep, Gary Patterson 
has built a great football program there. Jim Schlossnagel has got baseball rolling. And now Jamie Dixon. Looks like he's got TCU on track. How about this guy? Almost. Tell you, they're going to be a fun team to watch next year when we get back to Big 12 play. We all know what the NIT championship can mean for teams that return a lot of key guys. Lammers, a little too strong, and he is very frustrated. Looked up at the famous roof here at the Garden with an eye roll like, you've got to be kidding me. I'm one for ten from the field. Offensive foul called on Michael Williams. Does Georgia Tech have any kind of a push in them in the last seven minutes? We'll find out here at Madison Square Garden when we come back to the city. Bob Schusen, Fran Priscilla, Chris Budden back with tonight's Real Stories brought to you by Principal Financial Group. 19 double-doubles this season for Kenrich Williams. And Chris, his story is amazing beyond the numbers. He's just happy to be back on a basketball court. Yeah, this is a guy who sat out all of last season because he had microfracture surgery on his knee. I talked to him today and he said, this is just a blessing to be out here. Does it matter the points, the rebounds that I put up? He says, having to sit and watch all last year was excruciating. So this is a guy that's just enjoying being back on the floor, let alone put up double doubles. He's got a great nickname on that TCU campus, Chris. Kenny Hunt. Russell fits him to a tee. Tyree Jackson. Kenrich Williams with the steal. He's got a career high in points to go along with double double number 19. Could have been in the dunk contest out in Phoenix, but. He was a little preoccupied this week. Remember, Bob, this was a Georgia Tech team that a lot of people didn't think would win an ACC game. And they're struggling tonight, but it's been a fabulous year for Josh Pastor's club. Maybe not right now. They're going to battle the last six minutes. Well, tonight after the college slam dunk, three-point championships on ESPN. Stick around for Sports Center at night. Scott Van Pelt will have everything: NBA, NFL, college basketball, the NHL, all the sports news of the day. Sports Center at night with SVP, streaming live on the ESPN app and watch ESPN after the slam dunk and three-point championships. Bain for three. The long rebound of the corner, and that's going to be a foul. Kenrich Williams draws it, grabbed by Quentin Stevens. Again, the hustle of Kenrich Williams creates something for TCU. Yeah, take a look. We sent Kenny Hustle, right? Perfect example right here, Bob. That's going to be a long rebound. Watch him take off. And then Stevens realizes that he's at a disadvantage. Just pulls him down. good and TCU is pouring it on an 11-0 run and they are on their way to their first ever NIT championship here comes Kenrich Williams with the hit ahead to Bain saves it what a play diving into the scorers table is Washburn to keep it alive Bain for three wow Josh Pastor wants a timeout, and Jamie Dixon loves the hustle that he sees from his team. It's contagious. It may start with Kenrich Williams, but it filters down throughout this program. Bain had to chase down the loose ball. 
Take a look right here. They're going to get up the court. Bain thinks he's got a layup, so he saves it. Watch Chris Washburn, the senior. Remember, that was 0-18 as a freshman. You don't think he's excited. Well, you wonder what the carryover of an NIT title can be for a team. This TCU team, as you said, brings back their top six scorers next season. This year, already an all-time high in terms of Big 12 wins. They get a win over Kansas, who was ranked number one at the time in the Big 12 tournament. Looking for their first NIT title, but really thinking about where this program could go next year. Well, you know, having done this tournament for a number of years, I remember Wichita State coming in here and winning it. I remember Baylor and Scott Drew's team coming in and winning it. It's a good springboard, Bob, because you're playing championship basketball in late March. You hope that carries over through the workouts in the summer on into next season. Going back to 1985, about half the teams that have won the NIT have been in the tournament the following year. Kogi catches it deep, and he draws the foul. For well, the women's final four is set, South Carolina Stanford, UConn Mississippi State. Spots in the national championship game up for grabs, covered Sunday at 6.30 Eastern on ESPN. And for more, visit NCAA.com, the home for all 90 NCAA championships. Limers has it knocked away, tries to recover. Held ball, possession arrow will keep it with Tech. Yeah, speaking of Stanford, there you see Eric Reveno, former Stanford Cardinal. Played for Mike Montgomery, who's in the building tonight as part of the NIT committee. And he's done a terrific job with Ben Lammers this year. He's got a really good coaching staff. Darryl LeBerry on the left, Tavares Hardy, who came from Northwestern. And Reveno, they have really added a lot to Scott, to Josh Pastor's program. Kenrich Williams gets the steal on the skip pass. It's only like midway through the first half, he had no field goals. He's all over the box score now. 22 points, 12 rebounds, and four steals as well. Williams with the shot clock winding down. That will be a shot clock violation for TCU. Right now, if you're TCU, you use clock. It'll be very difficult for Georgia Tech, obviously, to cut into this lead. It's kind of a pick victory lap the last four minutes. You know, the question, here's a question for you, Bob, and I think I know my answer. Would you rather be a team like Tech or TCU and lose in the first four in in the NCAA tournament in Dayton or win five games in the NIT and call yourself a champion? As a coach, I, I think this is absolutely much better. I really do. I think the opportunity to play at the Garden, win five games. You know, if you're one of the first four in, you're probably not going to stay long. Although VCU upset that apple cart on their shot of smart. Well, it also gets you four more games and two to two and a half extra weeks of practice that you wouldn't have right. otherwise. You know, football coaches always talk about the bowl experience being really important because they get three weeks of practice yes. with their kids that they wouldn't get. And all of a sudden now, it's almost like spring practice times two. Those redshirt freshmen get a chance to be ingratiated to the system even more. This could really be a, a building block for TCU going forward. Chris Cotter back in Bristol. Now here's something you don't see every day. A Wolverine and a Spartan teaming up. Three-point shooting contest, slam dunk contest coming up from Grand Canyon Arena. That's in six minutes and 40 seconds time. Bob Fran. All right, Chris, thanks very much. Well, it certainly looks like for the first time ever, 
the NIT trophy is going back to Texas with TCU as the Horn Frogs, the first time they've ever played in a postseason championship game in their basketball program. Well, they've got some guys, certainly on the senior side, that have lived through tough times to get to the point where it looks like they will end their senior season as a champion. Yes, Trent Johnson brought in a terrific group of four young men. We've gotten to know them over the course of time in the Big 12. And I said it before, they took a, a back seat to some of these younger players. But in the NIT particularly, they've been really instrumental. And they're going to leave TCU as winners. And also guys that may be able to look back someday and say they helped Jamie Dixon start the winning culture. But let's remember now, Trent Johnson left a lot of good players behind. And Jamie Dixon has certainly taken advantage of it. You see Kabar Shepard on the left. Three seconds on the shot clock. Bain's going to have to let one go. And that will be a shot clock violation. But Chris Budden has more. Yeah, Bob, if you want to know how much this means to these seniors, I talked to Brandon Parrish today, and he literally got choked up while we were talking. He said, this whole run has been a dream come true, that when you've had a career of hardships, you appreciate the smaller things. And I asked him about coming off the bench this year after being a starter his first three years. He said, this year was all about winning. I didn't care how it happened. I just wanted to be a part of something bigger than myself. And when you talk to Jamie Dixon, the first thing he gets credit to is his four believers. It's really important, Bob, when you, you know, when you take over a program, I, this might be a really weird analogy, but it's like when you, you know, you, you marry someone who's got kids, like a second marriage, and you got to treat those kids like they're your kids. You can't say, oh, well, we'll wait till my guys arrive. Jamie Dixon embraced those seniors, and in return, they provided incredible leadership. And again, hats off to Trent Johnson for bringing in this high-character group to start it off. And now, who knows where this program could go. Uh, who knows if Kemrick Williams plays like he's playing tonight, how good of a year they could have next year as Lammers comes up short. Behind the back, showtime for Robinson. And Bain lays it in. Timeout, Georgia Tech. A 19-0 run. Well, a little showtime at the end. Alex Robinson, who's been so solid right here, going Curly Neal on us, like Curly did so many times here at the Garden. And Desmond Bain, young man out of Richmond, Indiana, he'll go down in TCU lore, is making those free throws to beat Kansas in a Big 12 tournament. It's part of the youth movement that's been combined with the veterans. Friday night on ESPN, we've got an NBA doubleheader for you. First at 8 Eastern, the Spurs and Thunder. And after that, catch the Rockets facing off with the Warriors. Our coverage begins with NBA Countdown, charged by Mountain Dew at 7. Also streaming live on the ESPN app and watch ESPN. Kenrich Williams is pouring it on tonight. The Big 12 double-double leader this year with 19. Four ahead of Jonathan Motley and the most since Thomas Robinson back in 2012 for KU. Yeah, and the uh, probably the shortest of those guys on that list, right? 6'7", Josh Jackson listed at 6'8". The other guys play inside. And as Chris pointed out, you know, hard to come back from micro-fracture micro surgery so quickly but uh, he's happy his teammates are happy I'll tell you who also is happy is Jim Dixon Jim and Maura Dixon right there that guy grew up in the Bronx he knows about uh, St. Helena's and Throg's Neck and the German League. Jamie Dixon used to come home in the summer and spend time from California in the Bronx and learned how, learned how to play on the playgrounds of the Bronx, Bob, like so many great players have. Arthur Avenue, because he's Irish, I don't know if he got the little Italy. Anyone with an appetite that knows anything yeah, about right. New York has gotten a little Italy. Absolutely. And here comes 
Josh Pastner's group of bench players getting a chance to finish off the last 219 and a standing ovation behind the Georgia Tech bench for all of the starters for Tech this year. In spite of what has happened tonight, this was one of the most unexpected and successful stories of college basketball that Georgia Tech won eight ACC games and earned Josh Pastner the Coach of the Year award in the league. Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, surprised everybody in the ACC and shocked the country when they knocked off North Carolina at home on December 31st. Obanda will go to the line. I thought what Josh Pastor told us was a funny story. Obviously, his program is trying to rebuild a fan following in Atlanta because they've been struggling. So they're playing North Carolina back in December. And with about 30 or 40 seconds to go in the game, the clock's winding down. Roy Williams walks over to midcourt, realizing that the game is all but over, and shakes Josh Pastner's hand. And Josh Pastor was surprised that Roy Williams walked over as quickly as he did. There's still time on the clock. And Roy Williams said, well, there's going to be a court storm. And obviously, you know, you guys are about to beat us. We want to make sure we kind of get our team off to the side. Josh Pastner said, Coach, if I were you, look around. About three quarters of the fans of the building are here for you. I don't know if there's going to be a court storm. The whole place is filled with Carolina fans, but that kind of emblematic of how big that win was for Georgia Tech and also what's still out in front of them trying to rebuild a following with their own fans. Absolutely. And they have brought some pride back to that program. Nice move by Kabar Shepard. We've got all those seniors on the floor right now. I'm pretty sure shortly Jamie Dixon is going to get those guys out. Scramble for the loose ball and the tap ahead by Robinson. Parrish gets to throw it down. And I think we're going to have that moment right now for those seniors. Timeout, TCU, just roll it so they can get those guys off the court. Alex Robinson's only a sophomore, but he gets a curtain call for a terrific year. And here comes one of the seniors, Michael Williams. One by one. Brandon Parrish will be next. And then Chris Washburn. And finally, Kavar Shepard. You see Tommy Herrien in the background, the assistant. He was at Georgia Tech with Brian Gregory and helped recruit a lot of those Georgia Tech kids like a Kogi, like Ben Lammers. Obanda scores. Jamie Dixon's going to get his 28th win in the garden, Bob. And I'm not going to say anything about the Knicks this time. He just did. <laughs> Knocking down a three is Dalton Dry. Obanda again. And now Josh Pastner will roll a couple of substitutions in. Little bittersweet that Tech didn't play as well as they have. But TCU, give them credit. They jumped out to that big lead early. The spin move off the mark for Austin Satilli. Down to the last 22 seconds. Says That's it the all. emotion when your career comes to an end. Yep. Says it all right there. Brandon Parrish. You try to tell it to kids, and your own kids. 
whether it's high school or college, it goes by in a blink. And they don't believe you until they're Brandon Parrish. They can't believe it's over. Yep. Uh, called a lot of his games in four years, and this is like winning an NCAA title to these guys. A steal by his brother Josh. And a windmill dunk. There's the punctuation mark. The Horn Frogs are the champions of the NIT. Great scene here at the Garden and a punctuation mark on really a constant foundation to rebuilding project for Jamie Dixon at TCU. It's why he came home to his alma mater. Exactly why he came home. For the first time in program history, TCU plays in a postseason championship game and they celebrate here at Madison Square Garden as NIT champions. Coming up next on ESPN, the State Farm Slam Dunk and Three Point Championship. So long from Manhattan.